Hi, welcome back to 19th and 20th Century Philosophy. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're talking about Willard Van Orman Quine, Morton White, and the Strange Path of Analytic Philosophy in America. To set up today's discussion, I'm going to I'm going to sort of take us back to some uh, earlier things that we've talked about and look at it, look at Quine and White in a larger historical context cuz I think that will help our discussion today. Um, so if we go back to earlier in the semester, we think about one of the key commitments shared by the progenitors and early figures of both analytic and continental philosophy, um, besides stylish beards, of course, was a, a form of anti-naturalism, specifically in the form of anti-psychologism, right? So, so the early figures in both traditions were keen to argue that um, psychology, um, the science of psychology, uh, did not bear a lot of relevance to philosophy, and philosophy um, was a kind of independent, uh, independent activity from from science, as we understand it, from the natural sciences, as we understand them. Um, now, an outlier in this respect uh, are the the pragmatist philosophers um, from America, who remained strongly naturalistic in their orientation, especially William James and John Dewey, who um, both made substantive contributions to the field of psychology and continued to um, uh, sort of synthesize philosophy and psychology um, into their later work. And I don't mean, I don't mean to say that, um, that the, these philosophers defended a kind of simple-minded psychologism about philosophy, a simple kind of reductionistic view, but only that they insisted on maintaining the kind of close connections that the anti-psychologism uh, sort of movement uh, in early analytic and early continental philosophy rejected, right? So this brings me to an important uh, bridge figure um, in this story, which is Clarence Irving Lewis. Um, pictured here, there's actually um, not a lot of uh, good pictures online of Lewis, uh, I discovered. So this is the best I could find from this book cover, C.I. Lewis, The Last Great Pragmatist. Um, anyhow, Lewis developed a version of pragmatism that he called conceptual pragmatism, and he was a particularly important, influential figure in American philosophy in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, he, uh, in addition to his sort of pragmatist philosophy and epistemology, he also worked in formal logic. He sort of critically engaged with the logic of Russell and Whitehead in the Principia Mathematica, receptively but also critically, um, particularly concerned about the way they represented the conditional, sort of if-then statements. Um, and Lewis developed what some have called the first sort of true system of modal logic, um, formal modal logic. So given the timing in the 30s and 40s, given Lewis's particular style and approach to philosophy, it's clear how Lewis might play an important role in the reception of analytic philosophy in America. If we think about where Lewis himself came from, right? Lewis uh, was trained at Harvard in the first decade of the 20th century um, by the pragmatist philosopher William James and then by uh, uh, Josiah Royce, who was a kind of interesting eclectic figure on his own right that unfortunately we haven't had time to talk about. Um, Royce was a kind of, um, well, he was a proponent of German idealism, perhaps the greatest proponent of it in America, but he was also kind of a quasi-pragmatist, and he and James had a long sort of set of debates. Um, by the time that Royce was sort of advising Lewis's dissertation uh, at the end of the first decade of the 20th century, um, he described Royce described his own view as absolute pragmatism, it's kind of a kind of a middle position. Royce himself was also quite interested in logic, including formal logic, and he developed his own kind of quasi-formal logical system. Um, that's that's a quite interesting uh, uh, topic, but beyond our scope. Um, so after receiving his uh, PhD from Harvard, Lewis taught elsewhere uh, in California for a while. Eventually he re returned to Harvard in 1920. Um, 
I would say uh, a few years later, he was joined there by um, Alfred North Whitehead, um, Bertrand Russell's collaborator on the Principia Mathematica. Um, Whitehead had, had sort of first focused on mathematics and logic, had kind of moved into uh, studying more philosophy of science and, and um, philosophy of education. But by the time he was moving over to Harvard, um, he had uh, kind of moved into a, a sort of study of really a quite traditionalist and, and pretty abstruse sort of metaphysics. Um, so, so at that time, he was, he was working out his so-called process philosophy or process metaphysics. Willard Van Orman Quine received his PhD at Harvard in 1932, training with Lewis and Whitehead. Um, uh, I believe Whitehead was his uh, dissertation advisor because he was writing a dissertation on Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica. Um, shortly after he received his PhD, Quine traveled to Europe and spent significant time with Carnap. And I think we can see the influence of of Lewis and Carnap on Quine's work. Um, Quine then came back to Harvard and ended up basically working there until uh, 1978. Now, after World War II, Quine emerged as a kind of central figure in American analytic philosophy, especially after publishing his Two Dogmas of Empiricism, which was taken to kind of dismantle major aspects of the logical empiricist program of his mentor Carnap, um, and it was done on sort of broadly pragmatist grounds. So, so these key notions of um, the analytic and synthetic distinction, um, the sort of uh, a priori questions of logic and empirical questions of science, those, those kinds of, a lot of that machinery was broken down by, by Quine and in, in, in a series of articles. And then in his um, 1969 article, Epistemology Naturalized, which we're talking about today, Quine articulated uh, what might be seen as a, as a um, actually a pretty, pretty simplistic version of epistemological psychologism. So here we have Quine kind of going back and saying, actually, psychologism uh, is not so bad. It has a lot to it. We should be naturalists of the really kind of um, flat-footed sort, right? So rejecting effectively the sort of origins of analytic philosophy in some sense. Um, now, in 1953, the same year that C.I. Lewis retired from Harvard, Morton White joined Harvard as a colleague of Quine's, and he would become a kind of major interlocutor for Quine. They would have a lot of sort of back and forth, and White drew a lot on Quine's ideas in his own work um, and expanded upon them. Now, White himself received his PhD at Columbia under Herbert Schneider, who had been a student there at Columbia of John Dewey's. Now, White worked in, in ethics, social and political philosophy, and the philosophy of culture, he also had a major, White had a major project of attempting to synthesize analytic philosophy with pragmatism, kind of uh, create a, a synthesis there. Uh, already White's views were somewhat similar to Quine's before they really started interacting. Um, you know, drawing on Dewey, White also uh, had opposed the analytic and synthetic distinction. Um, and once they were working together at Harvard, uh, White became quite engaged with Quine's work. Um, he, White accepted many of the sort of holistic and pragmatic elements of Quine's philosophy, but also criticized what we might call Quine's scientism, um, Quine's exclusive, sort of exclusive focus on, on science. Um, because White, as I said before, is quite interested in the social, political, cultural, ethical stuff. Um, as an aside, I think it's quite striking the role that um, Harvard plays in this story. How many of the figures uh, in this story who were really, I think, crucial figures to the, to the evolution of, of analytic philosophy in America, um, and, and they were, so many of them were associated with Harvard. So um, 
that's something I think that's quite interesting. So if we think about analytic philosophy in America in the latter part of the 20th century, we see a, a number of themes developing um, out of the work of, of people like Quine, White, others like Nelson Goodman, Hilary Putnam, and so on. We see a kind of pragmatic form of empiricism that um, you know breaks down some of the rigid, uh, rigid features of logical empiricism, but maintains a certain kind of connection to empiricism. We see an emphasis on naturalism, which distinguishes it from sort of earlier European forms of analytic philosophy and, uh, and British analytic philosophy. We see um, concerns about normativity, and this really gets at the back and forth between Quine and Morton White, this sort of um, concern about how are you going to maintain the sort of normative aspects of epistemology um, and, and ethics in the face of a naturalism that relies heavily on descriptive science. And then a sort of pride of place falling to logic and epistemology um, is another kind of key aspect of, of the movement. So at this point, you might find yourself asking the question, did analytic philosophy absorb American pragmatism when it came to America? And there's definitely some uh, scholars who've thought that and some reasons to think that. I mean, on the one hand, you have the, the sort of lines of influence on these early, um, uh, these early American analytical philosophers from the pragmatists. You have a lot of pragmatic themes breaking down of dichotomies, naturalism, and some of these other aspects that come, come through. Um, you have a number of these important American analytic philosophers, not just Quine. Um, White, although White is, is something of a marginal figure, a sort of a, a bridge figure. You have um, uh, Wilfred Sellers is one, Nelson Goodman is one. Um, you have the reception, uh, the sort of friendly reception that the logical empiricists receive when they come to America, and a lot of um, collaboration, cooperation over um, projects like um, the Unity of Science movement. So you do have sort of some reasons, some, some really compelling reasons to think that elements of American pragmatism were absorbed into analytic philosophy as it became dom dominant in America in the decades following World War II, um, into the later part of the 20th century. On the other hand, um, you know, one of the things that I think characterizes the pragmatist movement is its sort of uh, social engagement. You see this in Dewey, in his writings on democracy and education and politics. You see this in Jane Addams, in her, um, in her social settlement work. You see this in the work of Du Bois, um, uh, Cooper, um, to a lesser extent in Peirce and James, although I think there's still a significant element of social engagement there. And that seems to disappear as it's sort of filtered through the work of Quine in particular and some of the other uh, pragmatists, uh, or you might say sort of analytic pragmatists um, uh, in this period. Um, I think one of the reasons is um, the centering of logic and epistemology, um, uh, although you know definitely those are major themes in the pragmatist uh, tradition. Um, but but the way they were taken up uh, post World War II um, was definitely less socially engaged. A lot of the kind of thinking that the pragmatists were doing continued, but it continued in sort of social science contexts as opposed to within philosophy. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting questions about what's going on there. By the, by the later decades of the 20th century, 1980s, 1990s, um, there definitely is a resurgence of focus on the classical pragmatists, um, interest in the work of Dewey and James and Peirce, um, and, and the reincorporation of some of those more socially engaged themes, especially as feminist philosophers start engaging with pragmatism and, and um, the sort of uh, uh, broader perspective, Africana philosophers as well, like Cornell West, and a kind of broader sort of perspective um, is gained, especially as analytic philosophy becomes a less, 
um, sort of restrictive, well-defined movement and kind of um, sort of disperses into the mainstream um, without having a particular program to speak of. So those are some of my thoughts about the, the, the larger historical movements and questions here um, with, with reference to the, the themes in the, in the Quine and uh, Morton White readings for today. We'll obviously dig into the arguments in those readings in more detail in class um, and on Discord. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to raise them in those contexts or in the comments of this video. Otherwise, I'll see you next time as we take up uh, another movement in American philosophy, the sort of importation of not analytic, but a form of continental philosophy as the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory moves to California. So I'll see you on the West Coast next time. Bye.